Okay, folks, uh, welcome to uh, another session of PHI331. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, our video format a little bit differently today. Uh, what happened last time around was uh, our WebEx program uh, took about 36 hours to process the video I produced. Um, the issue being um, that just because of the coronavirus and so many people teleconferencing, uh, process times have been slowed down greatly. Uh, so I'm going to do something a little simpler. Uh, I'm basically going to record myself talking as I use the computer. Um, and uh, then I'm going to post these to YouTube. Um, so hopefully there isn't too much of a loss of functionality. Um, if captions or uh, speeding up or slowing down or something that's important to you, those are functions uh, that you'll be able to access through the YouTube link as well. Uh, so uh, if there are any glitches today, uh, bear with me. Uh, but I believe that uh, using YouTube will be uh, a slightly more uh, effective way of getting the material to you. Uh, for the time being. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get to it. Uh, last time around, we looked at Elizabeth Anderson and her criticisms of luck egalitarianism. Now remember, luck egalitarianism is the view that uh, bad luck that is the result of brute luck rather than option luck. Remember, option luck is just bad luck that's traceable to your voluntary choices. Uh, so the idea is the brute luck, the stuff that had nothing to do with your voluntary choices, is supposed to be compensated uh, by other citizens as a matter of justice. Uh, and we looked at some of Anderson's criticisms there. So uh, let's uh, get into it with Anderson. Uh, so now that she's given us a negative account, why she doesn't think that luck egalitarianism is the right way to think about equality, uh, today we're going to look at Anderson's positive view. So yeah, uh, her view is called democratic equality, so we're going to get clear on that view. Uh, we're going to consider how she defends this view, and we're going to focus especially on its claims about distributive justice. Uh, so the question about distributive justice uh, we'll recall is something like the question uh, what sorts of redistribution of resources and wealth are obligatory uh, from the point of view of justice. So last time we saw out the problems with uh, luck egalitarianism. As we just saw, luck egalitarianism is the view that brute luck uh, luck that isn't traceable to your voluntary choices should be compensated, but option luck, the luck that is traceable to your voluntary choices, should not be compensated. Uh, so Anderson's general criticism is that this approach to egalitarianism fails to show respect for citizens. So she says that it's paternalistic uh, because you have to make a distinction between brute and option luck uh, you're basically uh, making a distinction between citizens that you deem responsible enough to deserve compensation and those who are too irresponsible to uh, deserve compensation. Uh, moreover, Anderson points out that even when you're compensating a person for bad brute luck, uh, this involves a certain kind of contemptuous pity of the unlucky ones. So the thought here is that we shouldn't put an official stamp on private judgments. Uh, so for at instance, if you have the bad brute luck of being disabled, you know, being blind or deaf, or not so good looking, being ugly, uh, or being less intelligent, um, if we were to take the luck egalitarian's proposal seriously, uh, we would have to officialize uh, private judgments. So, you know, you could imagine somebody getting a letter uh, from the state saying, uh, Dear citizen, uh, because you are uh, so unattractive to others, uh, we are sending you this check. Uh, 
so Anderson points out that this sort of strategy for compensating cosmic injustices um, isn't a real show of respect for citizens. So the thought is, there has to be a better way to think about egalitarianism. Uh, so here are some of uh, the views that Anderson is going to sort of get out there on the table in order to get her positive view started. So Anderson says that when we think about egalitarianism, it's not about having equal amounts of divisible resources, you know, everybody having the same amount of money or the same amount of welfare. Uh, Anderson says that what egalitarianism is really about is being against natural hierarchies. So the idea is, with a natural hierarchy, the thought is, if you have certain inborn traits, you're going to be treated as naturally inferior, or inherently inferior. So the thought here would be a view of natural hierarchy, uh, some that have shown up in history would be instances like treating black people uh, like they are inferior or subordinate, uh, simply on the basis of their being black. Uh, or uh, we might think about, uh, you know, patriarchal societies as one that treat women as inherently inferior and subservient to men. So the positive claim that egalitarians are trying to make is that all adults, uh, you know, so everybody who is capable of looking after themselves and functioning as an independent citizen, so we might have to make an exception on this view for people who are adults but uh, incapacitated in certain ways. But all adults on this view are equal moral agents. So when you're an equal moral agent, we're not saying that everybody is just as good or smart or even just as decent as everybody else, but the thought is everybody has equal moral entitlements and everybody has equal moral responsibilities. So just to take one instance, everybody has an obligation not to murder others. And moreover, uh, everybody has the right not to be murdered. So this would sort of have everybody as moral equals. So the project of Anderson's view, like real egalitarianism, as she would uh, characterize it, is when we're interested in egalitarianism, we're about abolishing socially created oppression, right? So there are certain ways of setting up society uh, that create hierarchies and oppression. Uh, egalitarians are about getting rid of socially created oppression. So when we treat people as moral agents and want to get rid of socially created oppression, uh, our view is what Anderson calls democratic equality. So, uh, as Anderson puts it, it's a relational theory of equality. It's about equality of relations. It's not about equality of money or divisible goods. So yeah, it's not about how we distribute money or resources. So the main idea behind democratic equality, Anderson's view, is people all accept their obligation to justify their actions by principles acceptable to the other and in which they take mutual consultations, reciprocation, and recognition for granted. So the thought here is a demand for equal respect and also um, cooperation. And so, you know, we are in this together with others on this picture that Anderson is painting. So, uh, we might start to think about distributions of goods, right? What is a good distribution of goods on this view that we want to get rid of socially created hierarchies and that we want to establish equality in how we relate to each other? So the fundamental concern is about equal relationships. And then we're gonna be concerned 
about distributions of goods, not in a fundamental way, but we're going to treat distributions of goods as instrumentally valuable for securing equal relationships. You know, this thought of being instrumentally valuable. Uh, something is instrumentally good insofar as we care about it, insofar as it helps us get something that we care about for its own sake. So for instance, if I want to hang a painting on the wall, uh, I'm going to have to get a nail. Uh, now, the idea is that the nail is instrumentally valuable to me because it helps me get the thing that I want, which is uh, a well-hanged painting, right? Uh, if I didn't have a painting or had no goal to hang the painting well, uh, the nail would have no inherent value to me. The idea is that distributions of goods in and of themselves don't matter on this view. Uh, what does matter is that certain distributions of goods allow, they facilitate, or make possible equal relationships. So, uh, Anderson's question is, how would a certain distribution of goods, money, uh, or other divisible goods, uh, how would a distribution respect, uh, express respect for all? And the guiding thought that Anderson has is that we want to make sure that everybody has uh, the sufficient means, the sufficient goods to function as equals in society. So we care about um, having a certain distribution of goods insofar as it gets us uh, this main idea, right? Which is that we want to be living together on principles uh, that we take as acceptable to one another and that consultation, reciprocation, and recognition are, you know, uh, taken for granted and are fundamentally important. So, uh, what's interesting about this view for Anderson is she suggests that freedom and equality, on her view, aren't actually in conflict. Uh, so the thought is, uh, the more equality there is, uh, the less oppression there will be. Because remember, Equality is about a meeting of people as equals. It's about a lack of hierarchy. Uh, and in that context, um, a lack of hierarchy and a lack of oppression means more freedom. So the thought is, if we want a society of equals, uh, we want a society where equals are not, be exploited, are not being exploited by others. Um, and so we want to have a society, as Anderson puts it, that does not permit the creation of outcasts and subordinate classes. If you have a society with outcasts and subordinate classes, Anderson might be putting it a bit hyperbolically at the end of this paragraph on page 315, uh, but she says that uh, a society with outcasts and subordinate classes is repressive as any despotic regime. Maybe she's not being hyperbolic, uh, but it's a bold claim, right? So a despotic regime is, uh, you know, limiting the speech of people or throwing people in prison, uh, you know, for daring to uh, question the government. Uh, but Anderson notes that if we have people in subordinate classes, they will also be uh, threatened, often with their lives, uh, for trying to challenge uh, this setup. Uh, where their class, maybe on the basis of race or maybe on the basis of gender, are being oppressed. Okay, so uh, Anderson then fills out her view a bit more by appealing to a view called the capabilities approach, which has been developed by Amartya Sen. Uh, so the idea behind the capabilities approach is trying to figure out what it means for a citizen to live in a just society and to be considered a free citizen. Uh, and the thought is that there are certain states of being that constitute what it is to be well and happy. So things like health, nourishment, participation in your community, and developing talents. 
so there's a list, basically, of things that you're doing if you're living a good life. Uh, and justice and freedom are basically a matter of enabling people to pursue these states and achievements. So pursuing the state of health, pursuing the achievement of participating in your community. Uh, so these are things that constitute well-being, and justice is a matter of giving people capabilities uh, to pursue those states. So it doesn't mean that um, the state has an obligation to make you healthy or to make you participate in the community, but justice does require the state to provide people with the means of pursuing those goods. Uh, and Anderson points out, not all capabilities have to be promoted and protected uh, on this approach. So the ability to play cards well, or the, the opportunity to practice very specific religi religious rituals uh, don't have to be promoted by society in and of itself. Uh, it's only insofar as uh, you, you function in civil society. So what is civil society? Well, it's the sphere of social life that's meant to be open to all and which isn't part of the state bureaucracy. Uh, so it's things like public spaces, so things like parks, hospitals, uh, businesses, whether that be like a restaurant or a movie theater. Um, and, you know, it's even beyond schooling. And Anderson points out that the civil rights movement of the 1960s uh, was interested in these kinds of spaces as well as parts of the state bureaucracy. So the civil rights movement certainly was interested in protecting the vote for black citizens or getting them access to equal education. But another part was to make sure that parks, hospitals, and businesses uh, also uh, weren't discriminating against African Americans. So uh, we want to make sure that in order to give people the opportunity to uh, pursue the states that constitute well-being, we have to give them access to the parts of civil society uh, which are the capabilities that we have to give a person in order for society to be considered just. So, uh, civil society is, uh, and access to it, is part of a just society on the capabilities approach and uh, the way that Anderson approaches it. So, uh, for Anderson, uh, one important aspect of participating in civil society, uh, this sphere of social life, is going to be uh, participation in the economy. Uh, and on Anderson's view, uh, the economy can basically be seen as a system of cooperative joint production. So, she says, we have to think broadly and expansively uh, and acknowledge the fact that the work that each of us do depends on what everyone else is doing. So, you know, the fact that I'm able to teach philosophy is dependent on uh, not only things like administrators at universities and support staffs in departments, which are a hugely important thing in terms of helping me get my work done, but we would also have to think about uh, the people who help me get my coffee, uh, the people who uh, employ my students uh, and allow them to uh, get jobs after college or continue with the jobs that they already have uh, while studying. Uh, and, you know, we'd also, like, put in, say, you know, people who work at movie theaters, uh, right? Because those people uh, give people who don't work at movie theaters uh, access to leisure and entertainment and rejuvenates them uh, on the weekends by, you know, letting them enjoy something. Uh, so this is the thought that Anderson has, and we could talk about this in the discussion boards. Uh, is it true 
that the work of each depends on the work of everybody, right? And within this context, Anderson points out that given that the entire economy is basically, as she puts it, a cooperative, interconnected system of joint production, uh, consumers can't disclaim responsibility for helping those who occupy dangerous jobs. That would be uncooperative. Um, on Anderson's view, she points out that access to the economy does not mean that you just get a bunch of free goods. Um, so at one place in the paper, uh, in the first half, you already saw that Anderson is against having a universal basic income. Uh, for one thing, uh, the capabilities approach that she favors is about access to the economy. It's not about achievement or resources. So she points out that uh, you have a right in a free society to squander your opportunities for health, nourishment, and participation in the community. You, know, you can go to a town hall meeting if you choose, uh, but if you spend the evening on the couch playing video games, you've squandered a right, we might think, uh, but that is uh, an option that you have. Uh, and Anderson also points out that your right to certain goods can be conditional to working for goods. Um, so even though Anderson is against things like workfare, which is basically like forcing people into menial tasks in order to give them welfare checks, uh, she does say that the right to certain goods uh, could be conditional to working for them if you're able to do such work. Now, this might seem a bit harsh, but Anderson has a rationale for it. Uh, she points out that every right you have uh, brings about obligations for others. The thought here is this. Uh, you sometimes hear people say, with every right comes a responsibility. Uh, there is a stupid and implausible way of saying this, which is basically to say um, you having any rights is conditional on you being uh, respectful or nice enough to others. That's actually not how it works. Uh, certain rights, we should think, are inalienable. But uh, this is something that we noticed when we looked at John Simmons' paper earlier in the semester when he taught us about claim rights, right? Now, a claim right is a right where if I have a right not to be killed, that's going to cause everybody else to have a correlated obligation. So if I have a right not to be killed, you have an obligation not to kill me, right? Uh, so in economies, Anderson says, the rights we have in an economy uh, for access to certain goods uh, is going to bring about obligations for others. So uh, we may have obligations to provide certain goods uh, that are going to be necessary for others to stand as equals with us. Anderson follows G.A. Cohen's point that justification uh, of a policy uh, within a democratic sphere is about giving reasons for these policies that are going to serve as reasons for everybody who's affected. So this is a practice that we might call interpersonal justification. And the luck egalitarian, uh, when they appeal to option luck, you know, they say, your bad fortune is traceable to your choices, and therefore uh, you no longer have an entitlement to this benefit, uh, Anderson says that this line of thinking is going to fail the interpersonal justification test. So the thought is, you can't abandon a person in need of the means of participating in society, even if it's the case that these people chose dangerous jobs, you know, they chose to be loggers or policemen or you know, in these times, uh, that a person chose to have the dangerous job of being a healthcare worker, 
uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, right? Or we can't abandon a person in need uh, just because they live in a disaster-prone area. So if a person in California uh, suffers from an earthquake or a forest fire, or if a person living on the Gulf Coast uh, loses uh, everything that they have uh, because of a hurricane, uh, we think that this would fail the interpersonal justification test, uh, according to Anderson, right? Um, you couldn't actually look somebody in the eye um, and tell them that, uh, well, you do not deserve disaster aid because it's your own fault that you uh, suffer any of these disasters because it's you who chose to live on the Gulf Coast or in California or wherever. So on Anderson's view, even if you can give up certain capabilities of your own, right? So you can choose to not exercise your right to vote, for instance. You can't disclaim the obligations that you have to others. So no matter what, simply because those others have inalienable rights, uh, you always have an obligation to secure the freedom and equality of others. Uh, last time around, we thought about um, the problem of dependent caretakers. Uh, you know, these are people who basically do their work looking after children or dependent elderly people. Uh, now, Anderson points out that dependent caretaker caretakers, when we take a really broad view, are part of the economy, right? They are part of an overall system of joint production and cooperation. And so within this spirit, Anderson says, we should treat these caregivers uh, as having certain guaranteed rights that prevent them from oppression. So caregivers should have access to family funds. Maybe there should be universal caregiving options. So it's truly an option as to whether these caregivers stay home or whatever else it takes. It might be uh, one of the more controversial suggestions was the possibility that maybe married couples should split the paycheck perfectly evenly to acknowledge the work that caretakers do. So um, we can start to see how Anderson's approach, which is about giving people enough to meet as equals, uh, takes a different approach to questions of distributive justice as compared uh, to the luck egalitarianism. So consider a case. Anderson says that it's actually okay to tax cigarettes to recoup health costs ex ante, but it's unjust to deny health care from smokers ex post. So ex ante just means uh, before the fact of them getting sick, as in when you put a one or three dollar tax on a pack of cigarettes. But ex post is, you know, once this smoker actually has lung cancer. Uh, so the idea is that ex post denials of health care uh, make people vulnerable to losing access to their capabilities. Uh, so it no longer lets them participate as equals within society. Uh, and Anderson says, because there are certain rights you can never lose, uh, just casting away smokers uh, because their smoking is their own fault uh, is unjust. And remember, it's this whole idea of making paternalistic judgments about whether a person is in a bad state as a matter of their own responsibility, which Anderson finds deeply uh, disagreeable and implausible about luck egalitarianism, right? So the government should not deny rights on the basis of responsibility. Uh, and democratic equality, as compared to luck egalitarianism, doesn't treat rights as a starting gate entitlement. So a starting gate entitlement is just, you know, what you give a person at the start, uh, 
in society. And then these are rights that a person can lose or squander or, you know, lose their claim to. The basic capabilities, uh, you know, these opportunities to uh, participate in civil society, uh, as well as collective decision making, these are rights that can never be lost. I believe that the only exception that Anderson makes in the paper is uh, when a person is a criminal. And exactly which rights you lose uh, are, again, going to be uh, specific. So you might lose your right to have freedom of movement uh, once you commit a felony, uh, but that doesn't mean you will ever lose your right to not be tortured. Right. So, uh, here's another important contrast between democratic equality and luck egalitarianism. And that's the idea that uh, the only uh, thing that luck egalitarians are really focused on is the thought that uh, you should be compensated for hardships uh, that are involuntary, right? That are not traceable to your own choice. Uh, and Anderson points out that other philosophers, like Richard Arneson, have claimed that uh, people should be compensated for their involuntarily expensive taste. So if a person uh, can only be made happy when they're drinking fine wines or artisanal craft beers, for instance, uh, the luck egalitarian says, well... It's involuntarily expensive taste, but uh, that very involuntariness is exactly what makes it something worth compensating. Uh, they're going to say, just as it was no choice of a person's own that they wound up deaf or in a wheelchair, and that that's why we need to provide uh, extra means of support to those people, we should also provide... Uh, support to people with involuntarily expensive taste. Now, Anderson says that not giving you the capability to have a gourmet diet uh, is not a matter of oppression in the same way that not having a ramp into City Hall represents oppression. Because one uh, is not related to any worthwhile capability that we care about in democracy whereas uh, the ability of disabled people to participate in the political process is an important thing uh, that we need to prevent. Uh, so the thought here is that by taking the capabilities approach, uh, we can have a more nuanced understanding of what the state is and isn't required to provide. So it does require extra resources for the handicapped, uh, but it does not require us uh, to provide uh, you know, extra benefits to those with expensive taste. Uh, this is just a quick little note, uh, but it's something that you should uh, notice in the reading, is that Anderson develops an interesting objection to Rawls's difference principle. So Rawls, as we'll remember from last week, tells us, uh, the difference principle is what we would choose as a matter of maximum rationality, right? Behind the veil of ignorance, we don't know what place in society we're going to end up in. So, uh, we want to choose the setup that makes the situation for the worst off as good as it can be. Uh, now, Anderson says that Inequality, in and of itself, isn't necessarily bad once democratic equality is secured. Uh, the other thing, beyond maximum rationality, that Rawls tells us, is that insofar as there are inequalities, we should tolerate them only insofar as more resources for the better off is going to provide a tangible benefit to the worst off, right? Anderson's criticism of this is that this would require us to throw away goods uh, simply because they can't be divided 
equally or with any benefit to the worst off. Uh, but, you know, why should we have any problem with uh, my having five and you're having five and the third person having ten as compared to all three of us having five? Uh, what's the point of making the third person worse off if it's making neither of us uh, any difference? Uh, so inequality in and of itself is not necessarily bad once uh, everybody is allowed to participate in society, Anderson says. And moreover, if we just take the difference principle literally, it would forbid uh, large benefits for the middle and lower middle class. Uh, the only way that we can uh, secure those is insofar as we're making benefits for the worst off. But what if you had to throw away giant benefits for the middle and lower middle class uh, on the basis of a trifling benefit for the worst off? So again, Anderson, uh, unlike Rawls, is okay with a bit of inequality so long as everybody uh, is participating in society uh, with an acknowledgement of everybody's rights and obligations. Um, and moreover, we have to think about benefits uh, for each person, whether that be worst off, best off, middle class, lower middle class, uh, not just the people at the very bottom rung. Here's one last point. Uh, according to luck egalitarianism, right, we're just thinking about involuntary preferences and how we satisfy those involuntary preferences. But Anderson says we shouldn't actually focus on subjective preferences or states. So uh, she nicely brings in a good point, in my view, by T.M. Scanlon. So Scanlon tells us that even if you care about having a temple built for you, than being well fed. You know, you could imagine uh, somebody very religiously committed saying, I don't care about getting good food. I want all the resources in my name to go towards building a temple uh, towards my specific religion. Just because you want one of those things more doesn't mean you have more of a right to a subsidy for your temple than for food, right? Uh, we actually do have obligations to provide you with food, uh, but not uh, to build your temple for you. So what people want is not necessarily what we're obligated to provide. Anderson thinks that many luck egalitarians, especially welfareists, uh, have a hard time explaining that. But if you're taking the capabilities approach, uh, we can realize that certain, uh, certain goods matter more than others. And so even though you have freedom not to achieve your capabilities, remember you have the freedom to not vote or to feed yourself well or look after your health, uh, just because you have that freedom doesn't absolve you of the obligation that you have uh, to secure access to conditions of others' equality. Uh, and moreover, others still have an obligation to secure those conditions of equality for you even if you disclaim them. So I think that Anderson makes a really interesting and helpful point when she points out how uh, this explains uh, why a person cannot be sold into slavery. Uh, Locke told us at one point that you cannot be sold into slavery. Uh, and part of it was his view that your life is something that you don't have the right to sell. That gets complicated really quickly. Uh, I think that Anderson's explanation is very helpful. It's that even if you don't care about your own rights of autonomy and self-ownership, and even if you say, I want to sell myself into slavery, we don't have to take the paternalistic route and say, you are too dumb to realize that uh, you actually have worth that you yourself are not seeing. Instead, we can say, even if you don't acknowledge your own right of self-ownership, there's an obligation on the part of all others 
And the obligation on the part of all others is that you have an obligation not to subjugate or own people, right? So the idea is that uh, freedom to squander your own capabilities doesn't absolve others of their obligations to secure your rights. Uh, another point, uh, just on this subject of subjective preferences, uh, Anderson points out that in the case of disability rights, uh, what we want to focus on is objective tests for unjust disadvantage. So we want to think about how to set up society so that it works for everybody. And it's not about uh, the subjective hardships of the disabled. Uh, so as a matter of fact, as Anderson quite, uh, quite remarkably points out, is that many people with disabilities, say people in the deaf community, uh, don't want their hardships uh, to be treated as something to pity. Many people who are deaf uh, don't actually wish that they had the capability of hearing. Uh, they value their lives and they value uh, the communities that they build together. What they don't want is uh, a setup for society that objectively excludes them. Uh, and so Anderson is going to suggest that on this capabilities approach, uh, we want to think about instead of uh, these injustices that nature does to people, that's how the luck egalitarian would think about disability, instead we want to think about how socially created uh, ways of dealing with one another uh, can exclude or subordinate or oppress certain people. And that's uh, what disabled people are fighting against. So what does democratic equality do for the unfortunate? Well, it doesn't give them checks for having disabilities or not being good looking. What it does do is it guarantees access to the social conditions of freedom for each. Uh, so it doesn't have to similarly accommodate the expensive tastes of others because those are not the social conditions of freedom. You know, drinking fine wine is not uh, a social condition for freedom, even if that taste is an involuntary one. Uh, and so, as we noted, for deaf people, uh, what democratic equality is going to do for them is it's going to give them what they need to be social equals. So ways of participating in um, government, in education, in society, in uh, various ways. Democratic equality is not about compensating somebody for being in a pitiful state. So the overall aim is about making society more inclusive, and that's going to be a matter of sometimes changing social norms instead of compensating those with conditions that are considered pitiful. Uh, so she also gives the example of whether somebody is considered not good-looking, whether somebody is considered ugly. Uh, Luck egalitarians are just going to say, well, uh, if your bad looks are something that you did not choose, you should be compensated for it. Anderson says it should be more complicated than that. We should actually be considering whether beauty norms um, should be treated as so important. And in many cases, we want to uh, deal with that set of social norms rather than simply giving into those social norms and uh, sending people checks for falling short of them. Uh, so again, it's not about uh, treating certain people as pitiful, but it is about making sure that society is open and accessible to all. Uh, and Anderson points out, like, it's a complicated thing. We might actually want uh, certain plastic surgeries to be accessible uh, to people with certain uh, cosmetic uh, issues uh, in their physical bodies. Uh, so the thought is, uh, sometimes we want to change social norms, and maybe sometimes we also want to uh, subsidize uh, certain compensation for them. Uh, 
but we at least have to acknowledge that there's a question uh, not just about compensating the unfortunate, but also about questioning social norms. Uh, here's some final points about uh, democratic equality that are to be noted. Uh, Anderson says that access to conditions of equality is guaranteed throughout life. Uh, sometimes rights are treated as inalienable. Uh, we saw that in Locke as well, right? There are certain rights that you can't lose even if you don't care about them. Uh, Anderson is going to say it can explain why some are entitled to more resources. So, yeah, you do get more resources if uh, what's sufficient for securing your conditions of participating in society as a moral equal is a bit more expensive. So, uh, you know, society might be required to uh, provide uh, a person who's hard of hearing with a sign language interpreter uh, so that they can access things like school or business. Uh, but uh, even though we have to give more resources to people with disabilities, we don't have to compensate people for expensive taste or uh, lazy habits, like the able-bodied surfer who just wants to be a beach bum. Uh, next, uh, democratic equality does have ways of promoting responsibility, Anderson says, because it's just about making sure that you have enough to get by in life. So there's plenty of reason um, an incentive for you uh, to exercise prudence and good judgment and responsibility. And finally, uh, Anderson says that democratic equality can do a good job of articulating the concerns of actual egalitarian movements. So, you know, you could think of like the gay rights movement or the civil rights movement, uh, feminism, or more recently things like transgender rights. Uh, it's about wanting to be able to appear in society without shame, to be treated as an equal, to participate in society. Uh, and that this approach is better at articulating the concerns of real egalitarian movements as opposed to luck egalitarianism, which is maybe more of a, a philosophical... Um, fanciful thing. You know, we don't actually have uh, surfers uh, advocating to have their lifestyle subsidized, nor do uh, other uh, proposed candidates for luck egalitarian compensation. You know, the ugly, the gloomy, uh, the jealous. Uh, those people uh, are not uh, creating movements uh, in the way that, uh, the gay rights movement, uh, etc. are pursuing. So, uh, that's it for Anderson's paper, What's the Point of Equality? Uh, so her idea, remember, is that equality is about meeting as equals. It's not about equalizing the amount of resources or welfare for everyone. So, to continue this unit on, uh, on inequality in property, uh, we're going to start thinking about the question of reparations. Uh, last time I taught this course, we did one week on it. Many people were very interested in it, so I have expanded that week into two. Uh, so, uh, for next week, the first thing we're going to look at is an essay by J. Angelo Corlett, uh, his essay, Reparations for Native Americans, question uh, mark. So we're going to start thinking a bit more practically and a bit more specifically about uh, what, uh, what particular inequalities look like and what justice requires us to do about them. So, thank you for listening in today. Uh, Hopefully, uh, this YouTube format is uh, just as useful and accessible as uh, what we were using before. Uh, like I said, we've switched over to YouTube 
simply because it seems that uh, the video conferencing software we were using before is a bit overloaded now uh, in these times of coronavirus. So thank you for listening in. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing what you have to say in the discussion forums. All right, till next time, take care. Thanks.